can we all just take a moment to appreciate wizards? I mean, pondering their orbs, concocting great spells, sending countless mercenaries to their deaths because they want some new reading material. What's not to love about these wonderful megalomaniacs? Oftentimes I lie awake at night dreaming of becoming a wizened old bastard man with magical powers, and there's nothing that fulfills that fantasy better than the tabletop miniatures game Frostgrave by Joseph A. McCullough. Imagine, if you will, a world where D&D combat is actually fun, where the wizard is not just the most powerful member of the party, but also that that was an intentional design choice and not just your friend Steve power gaming the high hell and solving every problem in the dungeon with one of his four billion spells. If you love narrative-driven, competitive campaigns with emergent storytelling, incredibly accessible rules and materials, and most importantly, the ability to pick up pebbles and turn them into magical frag grenades, then this might just be the game you've been waiting for. So with that in mind, I'm Wheels from Dicebreaker, and this is why you should play Frostgrave. Long ago, the great city of Felstad sat at the center of a magic empire. Its towering spires, labyrinthine catacombs, and immense libraries were the wonder of the age, and potions, scrolls, and mystical items of all descriptions poured forth from its workshops. Then, one cataclysmic night, some really bad stuff happened, and the place got real messed up with a deadly, impassable blizzard. I might have slightly paraphrased there, but the point is that the age of Felsad's dominance is gone, but all those incredible magical trinkets are still right there, waiting to be pilfered by some opportunistic wizards. That's where you'll come in. A huge icy burial ground covered head to toe in magical monsters, crumbling ruins, but also a buttload of treasure, and it's finally starting to thaw. A new name seems appropriate, Frostgrave. With more curiosity than sense, you and as many friends as you like will be taking the role of powerful but low-level wizards who are seeking a bit of mystical enrichment in the city's bones. With some startup cash, you'll assemble a warband of marauders and misfits who are willing to put their lives on the line in your service in exchange for a pretty penny. Perhaps you'll even hire an apprentice to learn from your great mind and serve as understudy in the battles to come. When it comes to the wizard themselves, though, that's where you get the most customization of all. At the heart of Frostgrave's slimline rule set is the wizard's toolbox, a plethora of deadly and dastardly spells from 10 different schools of magic. Chronomancers can bend the very passage of time itself. Enchanters will theirs and their warriors' weapons with arcane power. Summoners will well, summon things, demons from otherworldly planes to do your bidding. You'll choose one of these schools to study, and whilst most of the spells in your arsenal will then come from that school of magic, you'll also be able to pick spells from all sorts of other schools for a wide and varied arsenal. Here's my wizard, Arias Rune Reader. As a sigilist, Arias can gain power from written words, drawing sigils on the terrain that explode from an enemy's proximity, uh, constructing magical bridges out of paper, and imbuing scrolls with the power he holds so that he might gift or sell his spells to others. As a sigilist, he gets to learn four spells to begin with from that school of magic, and then cast them at their base difficulty level. Everything in Frostgrave works on a d20 die roll, and for the most part, you'll only ever have to roll one die to get your result. A bit of a far cry for the 4 billion d6s rolled in a game of Warhammer. Melee combat, for example, is as simple as your attacker and defender rolling a d20 each and adding their respective fight abilities to their result. Once you've got that number, it acts as your ability score and your damage all in a single throw. It's refreshingly streamlined. It also means that rolls that just scraped over yours aren't then going to decimate you if their number is pretty meager. You've got to roll well to hit well. Casting your spells is as simple as rolling the target number or higher listed by their name, but spells are dangerous things. Fail to cast and you might take one or two points of damage in the process. If a spell is absolutely crucial, you can in fact damage the caster voluntarily to increase the value of your roll by one for every point of health that you sacrifice. Perfect for ensuring those clutch casts come to fruition. As I said before, casting spells outside of your own school of magic is not just possible, but encouraged. Frostgrave is a game of customization, and the whole arsenal of spells is at your disposal. But the more foreign the magic is to your wizard, the higher the target number will be pushed. 
Some schools of magic are aligned with yours, making them slightly more trivial. In this case, Arias doesn't have too much trouble with illusions, enchantments, or thaumaturgy. But most schools are more neutral and will suffer a decent chunk of penalty, with one school being completely opposed to yours, making them the trickiest cast to pull off. This is one of the best things about Frostgrave, though. It's never a game that outright says no. If you want to invest all your level ups into learning spells from an opposed school of magic and gradually whittle down the casting values until they become more feasible, then you can absolutely do that. And this is where I think that long-term sort of dedicated players of games like Warhammer, like I was myself, will really revel in Frostgrave's design both in the freedom that the game affords you and the respect with which it treats you. Games Workshop has often felt like a miniature studio first and a game design studio second. They make their money when you spend your life savings on a massive intricate model of some four-headed dragon that takes multiple weeks of your life to build and paint. But whilst these models are absolutely beautiful things, real works of art that you can be proud of constructing, and will look great on both the table and your shelves at home, if the game doesn't give you your just reward for the time and money invested in this special character or unit, then you're not going to be happy, are you? Like, you might not want to buy something that expensive and intricate again. That's why the amount of special rules and equipment and named characters and modifications that exist in Warhammer games is so overwhelmingly large. Everything has to be special, and you can only play with it if you've paid your way in. Frostgrave, and honestly a lot of other more indie miniature game offerings, takes the opposite approach. As specifically stated in the Frostgrave rulebook, you can play with literally anything that you have on hand. Board game pieces, whatever's lying on your table, Lego figures, wooden blocks, cardboard cutouts, even Warhammer miniatures, it doesn't matter. The game is built out of repurposable building blocks that you, the player, get to weave together to make the magic happen. There are official models provided by Northstar, and they're lovely. In fact, my wizard and his warband were made from those models. There's loads of variety, they're nice and cheap, and you can probably build two complete starter warbands with just like two boxes of figures. But if you don't like them, can't afford them, don't even worry about it. Turn up with anything you want, as long as they're roughly the same size as your opponent's minis, and you know you know what represents what, then it's all gravy. You're not spoon-fed giant tomes of unpassable lore and a list of main characters as long as your arm, either. Your characters are those main characters. It's the reason I brought up D&D at the start of the video. Frostgrave is as much of a role-playing game as it is a miniatures combat game. The game doesn't just support narrative campaigns, it's built around it. In fact, there's even a strong emphasis on things that your character can do outside of the battles that you'll be fighting. You'll gradually level up your wizard and their party, find new trinkets and legendary items that you can equip or sell on the markets. You can use that money to invest back into your warband or to build a home base with modular upgrades that earn you random rewards, increase your warrior count, or improve your ability to cast certain spells. You could theoretically learn more spells that are cast before your game has even started than ones that aid you in battle, if you so wish. Wizards already start as interesting and complex units, with their apprentices essentially acting as a slightly weaker copy. But as you play more and more games with your friends, they'll evolve into really complex and interesting characters. They'll learn new spells, develop strategies, have those strategies found out and countered by their opponents. They'll build a unique warband with their own quirks and qualities, establish a base of operations that's full of character and interesting boons, and have an entire TV series worth of fantastical tales of the exploits they've performed or witnessed. It's all that Warhammer narrative campaigns promise, but I've never personally felt they've delivered on, right here in a cheap as hell book, which doesn't require £1,000 worth of plastic and paint as an entry fee. There's lots of really fun interactions to be had on the table, even if you don't end up playing a lengthy campaign as well. First of all, this is a skirmish game, which if you've seen me talk about minis games before, then you'll already know I love to bits. Warbands have a maximum of 10 figures, a wizard, an apprentice, and eight soldiers of your choice. Only four of those soldiers are allowed to be one of the more powerful specialist roles, but even those can be just as susceptible to a swift stab to the gut as even the most cheap and basic unit. This is because Frostgrave has a pretty brutal combat system. Even if warriors are equipped with the strongest of armors and expertly trained, one bad roll could see them taken out on a single hit. 
This makes for some really fast and frenetic skirmishes with entire dynamics changing from the result of one crucial die roll. It also means that getting into pointless fights can really screw you over, inviting a more tactical approach rather than just slamming your models together and hoping for the best. That's all to serve the true reason that your wizard has delved into this fight in the first place. In Frostgrave, the true prize isn't some arbitrary victory points for taking out your enemy's prize dragon mini. In fact, you literally don't get anything for killing enemy units, even the enemy wizards themselves. Outside of scenario-specific objectives, all of your XP and rewards come from casting spells and grabbing the most precious resource in the game, treasure. After setting up a dense and common... I've just smashed a glass on the floor. How is this not even the first time this has happened? After setting up a dense and complicated border terrain, fitting the ruinous maze of Frostgrave itself, you and your opponent will sprinkle your beautiful board with some precious treasure. Now, what these treasures actually are will be determined after the game is done, but suffice to say that they are absolutely worth the effort. Each player will place two treasures each, and then one is placed slap bang in the middle of the board, meaning that there's always just one more intangible reach that you'll definitely have to fight over. And don't worry, this isn't a game for pacifists. You absolutely will be fighting. It's just that your goal will always be to drag those heavy treasure chests off the board rather than painting the snow red with your enemy's viscera. One of the things that I love about Frostgrave's singular focus is that you can always be prepared for the next random event that you'll always be encountering because the primary objective will always be the same. The scenarios in the book will merely add some side objectives that you could try to grab some XP from, as well as some interesting obstacles to halt your process towards those chests. Giant worm attacks, magical statues that zap you of random spells, unending skeleton hordes. There's a lot of danger awaiting you in the frozen city. It's a good thing then that those treasures are worth so much to you and your warband. One of the most fun parts of playing Frostgrave is after the game is already finished and you get to roll on the treasure tables to see what magical weapons and trinkets that you've unearthed. How much gold you'll be able to fill your coffers with or what new spells you'll be able to learn. All this stuff is included right in the main book, by the way. 20 different scenarios, all the base upgrades and magical items you could ever want, optional rules like randomly spawning monsters and critical hits. It's an absolute plethora of content packed into such a lightweight book, and there's plenty of expandable content to supplement it with as well, including fully fleshed out linear campaigns for long-term players. Not to mention there's an entire sister game set in sci-fi spacefaring future with aliens, spaceships, and everything else that you might expect from the genre by the name of Stargrave. If you've made it this far into the video, then I expect you've at the very least had your interests piqued by Frostgrave's seemingly endless entertainment value. If you've got some miniatures and terrain lying around, or don't mind constructing some stuff out of paper to play, then I absolutely urge you to grab the book or PDF and get playing. The barrier to entry is so absurdly low, and the reward that you get for playing far outweighs the cost on the door. Are you a big Frostgrave fan? Sound off in the comments and let me know what scenarios I need to try now, uh, now that I've developed a new obsession for it. And whilst you're here, why not like the video and give us a subscribe? We've got plenty of fantastic tabletop recommendations for you here on Dicebreaker, as well as even more on our home and hearth of Dicebreaker.com. Be sure to click the bell icon to get notified whenever we put a new video live. And if you want to support the channel even further, click the join button below this video to see details about becoming a member of Dicebreaker Plus for exclusive videos, emojis, chat badges, and much, much more. Thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll see you on the next one. But until then, have a lovely day.